Hello and welcome to Weird Wessex. My name is Craig. And my name's Andy. What are we going to be talking about today, Andy? UFOs. <laughs> I just looked up at the sky and saw one, you know, so. <laughs> or it's a street light or a weather balloon. Or all three. Or all three. <laughs> yeah. So, shall, I don't know, shall we go straight into the stories? Because I've got a few today. Yeah, me too, actually. I've been looking forward to this one for a while. So, yeah, yeah, here's what, what you got. So... I've actually got three today. So what I reckon we do is I'll do my first one, then you do one and, and vice versa. Sounds yeah. good to me. Um, so I've got I, I, I've got some that I've never come across before, and I've been into this sort of stuff for a long time. So there's a couple of slightly unusual cases that I think... Nice. Yeah, they're, they're a bit different to anything else I've heard before. And then I've got one at the end, which is more kind of got the classic phenomena. Um, yeah, so... The first case is about a lady called uh, Gabriella Versace. Very fancy Good lady. Good name. Yeah. And at 2 a.m. on October 16th, 1973, she was alone and driving somewhere near the English village of Langford Budwill in Somerset. She notices that there's a light coming from a single source, sort of stationary off in the distance. But as she approaches the light, it increases in size. Um, and then suddenly, the headlights go out on the vehicle and the engine stalls. Um, so she sort of rolls to a stop at the side of the road. Um, and she, she starts to hear this humming sound as she gets out the car. Um, and at first it's faint and gradually the sound increases. So she's kind of looking around for this source, trying to work out where the noise is. Um, but but while she's sort of distracted looking for the noise, the car's broken down, she doesn't see a nearby figure who strikes her on the shoulder and pushes her to the ground. Um, so she turns her head expecting to see some kind of attacker, um, but instead she sees a tall, dark coloured metallic figure. And the last thing she recalls seeing before losing consciousness were multicoloured lights flickering nearby. So... This story gets dark from here on out. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah, she, she's kind of in and out of consciousness. She finds herself in a field with this robot-like figure next to her. Um, and there's a bright silver-coloured spaceship on the ground, which she describes as being seven metres high and 12 metres wide, with oblong windows in the centre and yellow lights coming out of them. Um, so, yeah, so she realises that the humming sound she'd heard earlier was coming from the UFO, and she loses consciousness yet again. Um, but when she comes back to, she finds herself tied to a table in the centre of a strange circular room. She realises that all her clothes have been taken off and there's a blue blanket that's been placed over her instead. She describes the room as being cold and her hands and feet were being bound by some kind of rubber band. Which is slightly odd, I think. Yeah, it's um, not, not what you expect from an abduction story, but carry on. Yeah, um, so then... Enters three slender, fair-skinned humanoid figures, around five foot five, so pretty tall. I mean, <laughs> uh, they enter the room and surround her. They were wearing hats, and their faces were covered with masks so that only their eyes were visible. Um, the men examine her. I say men. The beings examine her, and they remain silent during the whole process, just kind of nodding occasionally at each other. Um, they take a nail slice from her index finger and a blood sample. They remove the blanket, examine her groin with a pencil-like instrument and then leave the room. Oof. Yeah. Nail sample. You don't, you know, yeah. you hear of lots of stories of probes, you know, mainly from Florida and Texas and stuff and those abduction stories, but, yeah. you know, you hear stories of blood samples, but, but nail a nail slice. Yeah. So there's, there's a few kind of details in this story like that that are what made it stand out to me, I think. Um, so yeah, to kind of finish this one off. So the humanoid figures return. They walk to the far end of the table, lift up the blanket and stare at the lady's body. She feels uncomfortable and struggles with her bond. And then she feels like she was injected with some kind of drug. And then essentially she's raped by the being um, and then, yeah, she kind of blacks out during the assault, presumably from whatever was injected Drunk. into her. Yeah. Um, and the next thing she knows, she wakes up and she's in her car 
fully dressed. And that that's pretty much where that one ends. I mean, it's... I'd, I'd love to see any, like, police reports that follow that up, you know? I mean, that's... That that is a dark one. You're right. I um... yeah. Oh, I have thoughts on it. Yeah. So I think that she was. I don't. For want of a better word, date raped. I think she was. For I don't understand the car bit at the beginning, but I think the rest of it could be un explained if she was drugged in some way. And I think. Between somewhere between being drugged and being like a coping mechanism for what happened to her. Fiend. So I think the rape happened, but I don't know about the rest of it. Yeah, that's. I mean, I I know people that have had you know sort of experiences with being drugged like that in that sort of scenario. Um, mostly, thankfully, that friends sort of managed to realise what was going on and grab them before anything happened to them or they went off anywhere with anyone. Uh, you know, it's, it's horrible. Um, but a couple of them have said to me, you know, sort of reality does seem to go really askew with these, you know, these things. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's horrific. Yeah. Yeah, but it's also, I mean, like you said earlier, you get all these stories of probes and things, but yeah, that one is all in, and I, I don't think I've seen any other cases. Quite no, I don't think I've heard anything way. like that, you know? Like the ones where yeah. you do have people describing that kind of encounter or scenario, it always tends to be like they're, they're very, they're, you know, sort of, lucid for it you know they're there they're in the moment is they don't describe as being drugged they don't you know um so yeah that that is that is peculiar that's yeah um I, I think you might be right you know I think I think that does that is a potential answer to that but yeah I don't know how that explains the light in the car I guess but whether I mean our brains are kind of fallible right like we rewrite our memories all the time Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, you know, right from catastrophic, horrible things that happen that your brain just sits there and goes, nope, didn't happen like that. That's not real. You know, which, yeah, is a yeah. Very, he's essentially your brain protecting itself uh, right up to, I don't know, my nan. Um, if if she ever if she ever listens to this, I apologise. I don't mean to uh, out your misdeeds like this, nan. But um, she accidentally stole some library books and then my dad said, oh, just, just say you dropped them off. And they must have been taken or something. And literally 10, about, yeah, pr probably a few weeks later, my nan was insistent to everyone that she actually dropped them off. And we're like, no, you didn't, nan, remember? <laughs> 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 She'd built it up in her head, you know, sort of, you know, so yeah. you, you, your brain changes things is my point, you know? Your brain mm. does, um, your brain does strange things like that. Uh, whether it is innocent and, you know, just sort of a self-defense thing like that, or whether it is to protect you from something quite, you know, catastrophic or horrible. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's, oh, that's dark. Yeah, I thought I'd start off on a light one, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, my one, my one has not got any of those elements in it, apart from a UFO. <laughs> um, it's interesting that in your one, she described the UFO as well, though, you know. Yeah. And the fact they yeah. were metallic and, you know. Yeah, you do get similarities with descriptions. I think we mentioned before with um, Betty and Barney Hill kind of started off this little grey men thing that yeah. kind of took off. Yeah. I don't know. It's almost not copycat syndrome, but. Well, in our collective conscious, if if we were asked to imagine an alien spacecraft, I imagine most people, most listeners, most anyone you go and ask in the street, they're going to fall into a certain amount of categories and we can like, we'll all roughly think of the same thing. It's going to be a flying yeah. saucer, it's going to be a rocket, or it's going to be something from that's close to a popular science fiction uh, film or TV show. Yeah. And I think that that is in our collective consciousness, you know, due to mainly media, but also these sort of stories what a UFO or what an alien spaceship is. 
Um, I bet it changed like over time, depending on usually on films that were coming out and things like that. And as you say, little gray, little gray men, you know, that yeah. has been kind of the accepted go to for alien visitors, UFO conspiracies. It's little gray men, isn't it? Or tall, gangly gray men. Um, well, it depends how deep you want to go. I mean, then you get into the races of um, oh, yeah, 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 reptilians. Like, One... they're, they're a supposedly different species from different planets. Yeah. See, the reptilians, did you ever watch that series, uh, V? Oh, yes, <laughs> V Nation and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That was, I, I don't know whether that piggybacked off the reptilian aliens or whether that's what started the reptilian aliens. That is a good question. I don't know. That's your homework, right? Yep. Next episode, we'll do the. <laughs> <laughs> Gonna have to watch it again. Yeah. Why Damn. I? Um, <laughs> so my my story, um, it actually, all, all of the stories I've got today, bar one, are actually in Dorset. Um, and several of them are, it's sort of smaller stories that come together um, okay. around the same area. Um, looking into it, though, the first recorded UFO sighting in Dorset was actually in Fleet, which is near Weymouth's little seaside village. And it this silver disc was seen floating above the sea by several people, several accounts of it, over a couple of days, I think, uh, in, yeah, 1733. So it's, it's, it's sort of got a bit of a reputation as a hot spot. Yeah. Um, it, it, the, most of the alien sightings that I've uh, UFO sightings that I've come across researching this have been to the west of Dorset primarily focused between Weymouth and Dorchester so the first one I'm going to go with is uh, there was a chap on October the 26th I think it was 1967 uh, a chap named Mr Brooks was walking his dog uh, I several... wasn't born then it's not me <laughs> different brooks maybe maybe a relative <laughs> uh any relatives have an alsatian and a dalmatian because that's what this chap had it was very clear those were his two dogs no uh, most of my family were around the london area i think fair enough fair enough maybe you'd come yeah. on holiday but anyway so this mr brooks of no relation um was walking along the chalk hills near dorchester to a place called uh Moyne down and as he's walking along the downs in these chalk hills this gale blows in, uh, probably, you know, sort of uh, factor eight, you know, sort of, it, it's a real, it's a real blustery one. And to the point where he's struggling to keep upright, he decides to go and take shelter in a ditch. Um, and he sat there for quite a while as this gale's blowing over, just lying down in this ditch, or this little, little pit, just looking up, because what else are you going to do? At that point, he sees a craft come into his vision. Um, it's metallic. It's a saucer, but interestingly, it's got what he describes as something girder-like sticking out below and towards the front of it, a kind of like a fuselage. Um, okay. And then from the back end of it, or if you want to call it the back end of it, he's just talking about what direction it came in from, I guess. There are three yeah. other girders sticking out at the back. And this craft remains there for a while, and he's just watching it, thinking, what on earth is this thing? And at that point, uh, things get weirder. The girders detach from the ship. Um, they then rearrange themselves in a cross about the circle, and that's when it starts spinning. And apart from a little bit of a tilt, it just keeps spinning. And this goes on for about 22 minutes before apparently it just shoots off into the distance shortly after the gale stops, and he gets up and goes back and reports what he's heard, or what he's seen, sorry. And now... He apparently had a cornea replacement, which were shakier things back in the 60s than they are now. Um, yeah. So like a corneal implant. And doctors and other medical experts decided that this was probably a floating piece of detached skin in his eye that he actually saw, just making weird shapes. Other mm. experts says, yeah, but they don't look like that. They haven't got straight lines and they don't whiz off all of a sudden and move around like that straight up in front of your vision. The other thing that kind of makes this weird is in Devon, two days before, on the 24th of October, two policemen apparently followed what they described as a cross-shaped object in the sky for 12 miles um, until it sort of outpaced them and went over the uh, border of Devon, which is what they were in, 
um, yeah. into Dorset. And that was two days before. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, that's a bit of a strange one. Um, so other other people blamed um, weather balloons because that's the go-to, isn't it? Um, yeah. Other people blamed military testing, which I think might have some more traction because it is down this way. It is a very heavily... Um, it, it's heavily tested on, you know, you've got lots of aircraft testing, you've got lots of military testing and bases down here. What year was this again, sorry? 67. 67. But see, so the, the thing we have on our side for stories like this now is that if it was military testing, eventually you'd imagine we'd see those kind of vehicles. Exactly, exactly. And what, what could that have been, you know? I mean, yeah. I know they were look. They were looking in at one point. I think it was more the Americans than us. They were looking into saucer type um, aircraft, but I don't think they really got anywhere with it. Because you imagine being yeah. one of the first people that saw a um, stealth fighter going over. You know, you yeah. know they they denied that thing's existence until just before it was around, like through most of the eighties but they denied mm. its existence until the Gulf War, essentially, the first Gulf War. You imagine being one of those people that just sees that coming over, you know, you're in like late, near RAF Lake and Heath or something, and one of those comes in late at night low, he's got a few lights and a dark shape just bombing over you, you know, just not, not like any plane you've seen before, you know? Yeah. It, it, it's a UFO, isn't it? <laughs> you, know, you don't know what it is. Absolutely, um, yeah. But yeah, as you, you're right, because we don't, you know, there isn't really any aircraft I can think of that would behave exactly like how he's describing it. Someone did say the weather might have blown in a bit of a low cloud bank and potentially it was a helicopter and the rotors were sort of going in and out of vision. And perhaps between his recent eye operation and the wind. Yeah. And that I see as a little bit more likely. And like the sound of the wind maybe carried away the sound of the helicopter. But again, it's it's a stretch, but it's a possibility. Hmm. So he wasn't abducted, no pencils up the butt? No, no pencils up the butt, no probes, um, no Mars attacks, aliens, which are some mm -hmm. of the best aliens, let's face it. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, no abductions, no abductions. Um but yeah, really, really interesting one. I, I, it, I like the fact it's not just the stereotypical flying saucer in that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, what do you think? It's do you think it? I, I'm more inclined towards the helicopter explanation out of all of those. But, again, but wouldn't that be the other way up though? Because they can they can yeah. perform weird maneuvers well that's the thing that's why they said it might have been to do with his eye you know sort of his core yeah. you know maybe if it was in the cloud bank he saw the helicopter body but couldn't properly make it out and then you know sort of you had just flashes of yeah. the rotors above it which kind of would make it look like those girders just a possibility again i can't imagine if there's a gale and if he saw it that clearly a helicopter would be sticking around in that weather you know be surprised if they flew in that weather to be yeah. honest but so they, they didn't there's no reports of them checking about flights in the area that kind of thing because sometimes no, it matches nothing up. that i found yeah. nothing that i found no yeah i mean we've got to take his word on it then haven't we i mean yes, <laughs> what <else can> you <laughs> do? <laughs> yeah i'm not sure about that yeah the eye thing i mean if he had bad vision then that could add to the effect yeah but oh, um, yeah, yeah. I I don't I don't really buy the floating skin thing. I don't think that's that's exactly that doesn't sound like something a floating speck of skin on a new cornea would do. But you know, I'm I'm no eye doctor, so. And your well, and your vision like flips and stuff in your brain, doesn't it? Because everything's yeah. upside down. And so maybe something went wrong there. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not a doctor. Do you know if you that about me? <laughs> You're not. I'm not sorry. I won't let you examine me anymore. <laughs> not anymore. Damn. <laughs> Go on, give us another story. Yeah, so this is another one that I came across that this one I found kind of amusing. Um it's a bit more lighthearted than the last one. But it's also it, it's got an interesting outcome. Um 
So on the night of the 12th of August, 1983, 77-year-old ex-military veteran Alfred Bertu, he's night fishing with his dog. His dog's called Tiny, which I thought was awesome. <laughs> I don't know what the dog was. I'm imagining some big vicious thing called <laughs> Tiny. <Yeah. laughs> um, and yeah, they they go out night fishing on the banks of the Basingstoke Canal in Aldershot. So Alfred takes out his flask beaker, pours a cup of tea, um, and about 15 minutes later, he sees a strange light heading towards him. It eventually settles down behind some trees about uh, 300 foot from his position, and he could kind of see the light poking out through the gaps in the tree branches. Then his dog starts to growl nervously. And it's then that he begins to make out that there are two forms heading towards him from this source of light. And so he kind of stands up to get a better look. And the two, the two figures stop about five foot away from Alfred and the dog. And what he describes them as is four foot high humanoids wearing pale green coveralls that appeared molded to them. No signs of buttons, zippers, or fasteners of any kind. And That's each wore right. pale green helmets with blackout visors. So, one of the figures motions for Alfred to follow them. And he leads them along the canal path towards the lights, which turn out to be a metallic, 40-foot wide craft, which appears to rest on two ski-type runners. Ah. And it has a, a set of steps that protrude from the porthole in the side. So yeah, so that's that description. That's kind of you could maybe if yeah. it was flying in the air. The girders, the girders, the runners, maybe, which I hadn't come across before. So that's why I was interested when you mentioned it. But, um, so yeah, so one of the forms uh, enters the craft, and they motion for Alfred to follow them inside. Where inside he finds an octangular room that appears to be seamless as if it was moulded just from one piece of material. He also notices a very strange aroma that he describes as decaying meat. There's another strange element there. That is. Yeah. An unseen voice instructs him to come and stand under the amber light. So he does this and he stands waiting for further instructions until a voice again sounds, but this time it says, what is your age? Albert informs the voice that he would be 78 on his next birthday. He was then asked to turn around in the column of light. A further wait ensues until the voice finally calls out, you can go, you are too old and infirm for our purpose. Wow. <laughs> By the time he's back at his fishing spot, there's a sudden ultra bright glow which lit up the entire area and he turns to see the strange craft shoot off into the sky at a fantastic speed and then it was gone. A look at his watch tells him that it's been about an hour since he first saw the craft. He settles back down to fish and the night passes without further incidents but around 10am two mounted Ministry of Defence policemen approach him to make small talk and he mentions the strange lights and the glowing craft to which one of them replies, yes, I suspect you did see that UFO. I expect they were checking on our military installations. Which kind of implies they're used to them coming in and having a look and seeing what's going on. Bloody aliens coming over here looking at our military. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so with that, they go on their way and shortly after noon, he returns home, tells his wife about the evening's events and then retires for a nap. Uh, but... Later on, he tells the story to the UFO investigator and author, Timothy Good, who spent a considerable time with Berto. Um, and he firmly believed that in spite of the odd small details, it didn't make particular sense that the incident actually took place. I believe, I believe that um, Alfred died about two years later. So he was right at the end of his life and, and he, he believed it right up to his death. He didn't change his story at all. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's interesting, that he, getting shaded by some aliens. You're too old and infirm for our purposes. But then it goes back to that first story. What was their purpose? What were yeah. they going to do to him? This is true. I mean... Well, there's that smell of rotting meat that he describes going into the craft. I mean, was that... Were they harvesting humans for flesh? That's why he's too old? Yeah, that's... that's sinister i don't know it's a weird story yeah the smell of rotten meat i'm sure i've heard that in other 
uh, stories as well. I mean, you get strange. I mean, you know, you imagine if it is an alien spacecraft, it would be strange smells. But rotting meat that does imply that, either, as you say, harvesting or perhaps if it's rotten, they're not even harvesting; they're just killing people. But um, but then they would dump the bodies and fly off. You would assume. And maybe they're. Would you... I don't, don't understand the alien mind. Oh, here we go. I've brought up a a lovely picture of Alfred. Oh, that that's. He he looks like he should be famous. That 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 looks, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't see why you would tell people that story unless it happened. Because like you say, it's a bit insulting. <laughs> There's no good outcome. It's it's interesting actually. So when we came into this and or doing UFOs, I I I just went with craft stories. You've actually found two with encounters as well. So I've got a little one. Dorset, an article on the Dorset Echo. There are two reports of UFO sightings just um, over the county line in Somerset of March this year, followed by the appearance of a sinister-looking seven-foot alien wearing a Stetson hat. Yeah, blend in, I guess. Spotted at a bus stop in Yeovil last December. Um, this alleged extraterrestrial was described as uh, having black skin with no face, spikes down its side, and silky hair. Remaining motionless within a box light surround from which sparks issued, the eyewitness, who describes the experience as something like out of science fiction, was so disturbed at what he'd seen that he had problems sleeping thereafter. Indeed, reports of a Stetson wearing extraterrestrial entity made the national press. Man spots giant seven foot evil alien, don't know why he's evil, um, wearing cowboy hat catching the bus in Yeovil, uh, making some dramatic copy. Um, I don't know why he's waiting for the bus. Maybe his craft had taken off without him. But yeah, apparently. That's my next that. question: is why is he waiting <laughs> for the bus? Um, well, a lot of these stories. I think there's a bus that goes from Yeovil to Dorchester, and that's a nice little segue actually, because a lot of these stories happen around Dorchester. So you know, maybe he was catching the bus back to his craft. Who knows? Um, but then you'd expect the people on the bus, at least the driver, would report that this... Maybe the, maybe the bus was full. Maybe didn't have any change. Can't imagine aliens carry change. This was probably before tap on, tap off, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that, that's a genuine, that was a genuine, uh, genuine story. Um, but a lot of these stories in Dorset do seem to focus around Dorchester and Maiden Castle. The... First one that I've got is from 1993 over Maiden Castle. Now, a chap called um, Rob Dickinson was out walking um, along the hills near Maiden Castle. I'm reading from notes here as well, because this is an account that he actually posted himself. Yeah. Um, so I was looking for and photographing only remaining traces of that season's crop circles. So he was of a mind for this already, but it is a hot spot for crop circles. I did think about talking about that, but I, given where you are, you know, in the fictional county of Wiltshire, I assume Crop Circles will probably be its own episode at some point. I think we should do an episode, yeah. Maybe yeah. an on-site visit somewhere. Absolutely. We've had in the last, I think in the last three years, we've had two in the field as you leave our village. So, I mean, it's in walking distance. Nice. There was one where I was growing up in Hartford, I remember. Um, but I'll... Yeah, I might I might be able to get us a guest for that one. We'll see. In Wiltshire, which, you know, doesn't exist. Um, yes, yeah, so I was looking for and photographing any remaining trace of that season's crop circles. Uh, standing on the B3159 road overlooking Maiden Castle Hillfort and the site of a previous small crop circle, I witnessed uh, about 11am two flashes of light seemingly from the sky to the northeast. This prompted me to take a sequence of photographs panning from north towards Maiden Castle around to the east along the road. Apart from the flash of light, nothing anonymous was seen in the sky. I returned to the same site later in the day at 4pm and thought I witnessed another flash of light, this time from the south. I took another sequence of photographs, this time to the south and the east. Once developed, the film showed a total of four anomalies, none of which were seen whilst photographs were being taken. If you, I could screen share it or you'll see the photo. Yeah, sort of tic-tac almost shaped, mm. like a pill. Yeah, which is quite a common one. It almost looks like a glitch when the photo was taken, you know, like because I'm assuming if it yeah. was old fashioned film, they're dipping it in the chemicals and 
Mm. I don't know. He's in the dark room and something's just... I don't know. And the fact he didn't see it. But, you know, he said it was prompted by a flash of light. Although, I don't know. That is interesting. I think it is something unexplained. I'm not saying that it's aliens. or It it's almost looks like there's a hole in the sky. It does. I was just thinking that. Like, something's going to drop out. Like, you know that first Avengers film where all the... Um, Skatari start, you know, swarming out of the hole above New York and attacking New York. Kind of that thing, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. It does. Rather than a craft. But, you know, yeah. that or potentially if, you know, not accusing anyone of anything, but potentially if it is a fan of crop circles and things already, maybe it is on purpose, you know? Yeah. I mean, people do. I don't get it myself because I think if you're looking for. Like, mm. If I took a genuine picture, then yeah, I'd share it. But I don't. I wouldn't be interested in faking it because that's. Yeah, I think people that fake it, they don't believe. They're just looking for a laugh, you know. And you do get those as well. But I think genuine believers yeah. probably wouldn't fake anything. Let's mm. stretch, you know. I've I've made my opinions been known before on things like uh, orbs and the like, uh, in photographs. But you know, they might stretch something that is easily explainable as something that is. Um, you know, they, they they might decide, oh no, that's definitely a craft, that's definitely an orb, whatever. But yeah, I don't think they would fake it. But yeah, so it's sort mm. of more of a, a disc kind of looking thing or yeah. yeah. Um there is another sighting in nineteen ninety eight, um, which I'll pull up now. I'm not sure who saw this one, but it is a more of a tick the classic tic tac, and that was over Maiden Castle as well. Again, sort of more of an oblong. It could be a saucer on its side, like quite a thin profile. There's sort of this oblong sort of craft. Um, it looks very 90s. Like if if you were gonna if you googled 1990s UFO footage, that is exactly the sort of picture I'd imagine. I'm not convinced by that one. That's um, I mean it's too grainy. It's been zoomed in on the picture as well. So yeah, it's... yeah, I don't know. And there is uh, accounts going up to the early 2000s of UFO sightings. Although, interestingly enough, and again, maybe this is something for another episode, but before uh, Maiden Castle was known as a hotspot for crop circles and UFOs, it was known as a hotspot for fairy activity. Uh, and you've got wonderful stories there. Again, I'm not going to go into them today because it's a different topic, but it's interesting that this monument, this old hill fort, biggest one in England, has these stories attached from more of the modern take of UFOs, but his, you know, historically it was fairy stories, you know, early 1900s and prior to that, it was, it mm. was, yeah, that's where fairies live. That's where people went missing for a year and a day, you know? Yeah. Um. So yeah, that is, that's another one from me from Maiden Castle. There are, there are a few out there. I just decided I didn't want to talk about Maiden Castle the entire time. <laughs> so I thought I'd stick to those. Didn't you say? I thought you said that that was going to have an encounter as well. Oh no, the encounter was yeah. the uh, the bus. I, I gave. Oh, up. the bus one. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. The alien on the bus. Yeah, Dorset. They yeah. don't want to come and speak to us in Dorset. Apparently, an interesting description. I mean, we mentioned different kinds of beings earlier as well, because um, there's the thing about Bigfoot being an alien race, isn't there? Yes. Or at least some people say alien race. Some people think pets that are being dropped off. And they go off and then they collect them again. What is it like letting him out for a wee? Which is what, yeah, so like that's why no one ever finds them because they let them out, they run around the woods for a bit, they might get spotted <laughs> by someone. I've never heard that collected. one, but I love it. That is that is my new head cannon yeah. for Bigfoot, their alien pets <laughs> dropped off and Which yeah. is why we never find them and we never find bodies, because they're not here all the time. They just come for a visit and a run around in the woods. Has anyone seen the Yeti and the Bigfoot on the same day in different places? Because, you know, maybe the Yeti is Bigfoot with his winter coat on. So, you know, if they come by and he's got his winter coat on, they drop it off in the mountains over, you know, and then... Um, I mean, they're yeah. similar. Yeah. I think in uh, Australia, don't they have the Yowie as well? I think is a similar... I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Alien pets, all right, I like that. Yeah. Anyway, we need to keep on topic today. Yes. I'll get told off again. <laughs> all right so my last story 
um, again, completely different to the other two. And I only actually saw this yesterday. And this this could be an episode on its own. I've kind of this is the abridged version of the story because it has so many kind of classic alien elements, but also what I'm calling classic. But we haven't mentioned them yet in this episode. So oh, go on. this is in uh, Avely, which is in Essex. Um, so it happens on October the 27th, 1974, that Avis family were driving along a country lane near Hornchurch. Two of the kids had fallen asleep when Kevin, the middle child, asked about a light that he could see over some nearby houses. Glancing around, the parents see an oval-shaped pale blue iridescent light like a star hovering over their houses. It appears to be travelling in the same direction as they are. Now, at first, they assume it's a helicopter, but before long, they're referring to it as a UFO. And it had a very strange sort of stop-start motion as it's following them. It would sort of fly forwards a bit, and yeah. then stop, and then fly forwards a bit. Um, so anyway, they continue on their journey, uh, passing a local pub, when they get a sudden feeling of something, that something's just terribly wrong. You know, you just get those gut feelings sometimes. Um, so the engine and the tires go silent and the only sound that they can hear is from the radio. Now that could be a topic on its own because there's, it's known as, I'm sure you've come across the Oz effect before, yes. before something weird happens, even Bigfoot encounters, that kind of thing. People describe how suddenly it was just dead silent, all the birds go quiet, a bit like when um, there's an eclipse. And suddenly it all goes deadly silent. That's, Which yeah, that's... is sinister as heck in itself. Yeah, so that's why I say that could be an episode on its own. But yeah, so everything goes silent except the radio for some reason. Um, and as they go around a bend in the road, they can see not more than 30 metres in front of them and covering the whole road, a thick, dense green mist. Um, just as they spot the mist, the radio starts to crackle and smoke which causes the father of the group to pull the wires out of the radio. Not really sure how that's related, but that's what happens. Um, and then they're engulfed by the fog. Um, the mother recalls the car jerking violently as the mist curled around the car. Um, but with two children asleep and Kevin awake, um, so they, I, I don't think I mentioned their names. So John and Elaine were the, the parents. They recall that it was very light inside the fog and that it felt very cold. A tingling sensation was felt and there was dead silence. The car jolted as if it passed over a humpback bridge. And then before they knew it, they were out of the fog. And they recall probably only being in the mist for a second or two. Well, the two children are still asleep, but Kevin and the two parents don't speak about the incident. They just decide that they need to get home as quickly as possible. They expected to be home about 10.20 p.m. And they arrive home, it's 1 a.m. Leaving around three hours that they can't account for. Ooh. So we've got the classic missing time. Um, yeah, after the incident happens, it doesn't end here. So they, they make really significant changes to their lives for unspecified reasons. So the father has a nervous breakdown initially um, and has a change of career. Complete, I think he goes from carpentry to working with people with mental illnesses. Uh, and the mother Elaine decides to attend college. They both stop eating meat and drinking alcohol, saying that the meat and fish now made them ill. Um, and John also gives up his 60 to 70 a day smoking habit. Just quit. Cold turkey. So what I'm hearing is alien life coaches. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, the, the son who was awake. So the, the other two children don't get mentioned again, to be honest, but Kevin becomes well beyond his years at school. Whereas previous to that, he'd been reported as being behind. So this is where the other kind of weird shit starts to happen. So the family report unnerving incidents around the family home after the encounter, including objects levitating, clicking noises, and the sounds of Morse code. 
Um, and young Kevin reports seeing a strange figure beside his bed on one occasion, similar in looks to that of a clown. Oh. Yeah. So that, that, I mean, that is another element that seems to happen. If you look into UFO reports around the world or people that have been abducted, often they're followed by poltergeist type activity. Okay, so like some kind of observation of them or don't know i don't know um both john and elaine also admit to strange dreams in which creatures would examine them on long tables under hypnosis um so yeah so john gets hypnotized but elaine decides she's not for that and it was decided kevin was too young and it might fuck him up so they don't send kevin for hypnosis but um john agrees to have it done he recalls that as the car enters the mist, a white beam cut through the car, lifting it off the ground. He remembers finding himself in a big room with tall, peaceful beings in one piece, colorless suits with no visible mouths. So again, like my previous story where they said yeah. about masks and you could just see the eyes. Yeah, and one, one sort of whole suit sort of thing, you know. Uh, he recalls that they had pink eyes and communicated by telepathy. They put him on a table and they ran a bar-like instrument over his body. And he says, a small being was present at the table. It had fur, a fur-like covering and made chirping sounds. Baby Bigfoot. <laughs> um, yeah, so he encounters only three tall beings and only one of them actually communicated with him. When John asked the beings for their reason for visiting the earth, they replied, no visit they are here always ask where they come from they respond there was no need for them to say and that they had no need to return home um and that is where that one ends that's that's possibly my favorite one i i really <laughs> like that that's good I, I need to look more i need to look into that one so you got fog ufo aliens Missing time, poltergeist activity, hypnotism. Like, we've covered it all. <laughs> got everything. That's got everything, man. Yeah, I only found that last night. That's good. Yeah. Um, I've, yeah, that's, again, you've got the, the hypnotism bit, you know. it's That sounds quite fantastical to have made up. I like the fact that they've been their lives changed afterwards for arguably for the better, apart from the dreams, you know, you've got the kick and smoking habits, you've got the excelling at school, you know, uh, going from like a job, which, you know, no, nothing wrong with being a carpenter, but to one where you're sort of more directly helping people where you're going back to college or university, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, you know, on one hand, did the aliens sort of improve their lives or these visitors or whatever they were? Or uh, are they indeed the original family? You know? Oh, you're suggesting they've been swapped. Changelings. I mean, it does bring in the fairy lore, but then they, would they remember that they were changelings? Would they have the memories of the family? Um, it's a good point. I don't know. I'm not a changeling expert. <laughs> I'm not a changeling doctor. Because they seem to remember their past selves yeah and they don't seem to remember the sort of abduction yeah it's odd as well that the two children that are asleep weren't affected no true perhaps they just let yeah. them sleep maybe they're too young kind of like um our buddy like alfred old and infirm yeah you know <laughs> don't know they like him young according to that story yeah, well, maybe there's two young, you know, maybe there's... Yeah. You know, but if they are doing it for the betterment of these people, perhaps, you know, those kids, they don't need their lives changed at the moment because they're, you know, they're too young. They're, they're still they're still learning. Yeah, so that's, that's my three, top three UK Wessex-based UFO stories. Nice. Um, I've got... I've got one more, but there's there's one last one in Dorset that I would like to read to you, which I just okay. remember exists. Um, so let me find it. 
so this one is from the Bournemouth Echo, if it will let me on and there's not a paywall. Um, I saw this in the Metro initially, but I believe, yeah, that's where the article originally comes from. Um, I saw a UFO over Bournemouth and I'm not crazy. Um, rocker Noddy Holder of Slade insists that he Ooh. felt the noise. See what they did there. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> I've done this one for Christmas. <laughs> um, over Bournemouth uh, in a close encounter with a UFO. Uh, the colourful star, most famous for his ubiquitous festive hit, Merry Christmas, everybody, said that he saw a circular flying saucer emitting beams of light flying over the sea while staying in Bournemouth. Recounting the town on Radio 2, he said his Bournemouth hotel room had suddenly filled with a white light at midnight and he first thought it was from a police helicopter. I put my paper down, look out, and there was a flying saucer. I'm serious here. It was a flying saucer. It whizzed across the sea, just like you see in the movies. It was circular with all beams of light coming out of it. I described how it raced over the surface of the water with such speed that massive waves came up, but his wife wasn't so convinced. She wouldn't believe I'd seen this flying saucer. She said, oh, you're drunk, you fool. It's a different song, that. Um, uh, it's one of them police helicopters. But the day after the sighting, which happened some five years ago, um, bear in mind this was in 2009, so this is early 2000s. He said he turned on the BBC News to see reports of UFO sightings in a straight line from Gloucester down to Bournemouth and along the south coast. Hmm. It's not the first time the area has experienced such visitations. In fact, it appears to be somewhat of a UFO hotspot. Strange lights are often spotted over the sky over the festive period. Santa, clearly. Um prompting flurry of calls to the Daily Echo newsroom. They're described as moving around like an insect um, and as bright as a car headlight. Uh, there was also, in February of that year, uh, sightings of a cigar-shaped object over the Pool Harbour and Swanage. So, uh, yeah, Noddy Holder has seen a UFO <laughs> in Bournemouth, and if you're not going to believe him, you know. Um, Surprised so you didn't bring him on as a guest. <laughs> Well, maybe, maybe next UFO episode will work, <laughs> you know. It's, I imagine he's busy around, you know, sort of this time. Actually, of no offence, but I don't even know if he's still alive, to be honest. He's still alive. I'm pretty sure he's still, still alive. going. My last story actually takes place um, in Hertfordshire, which was Wessex briefly. <laughs> um, Pushing takes, the boundaries now. <laughs> that's it. It takes place in the town of Hertford, um, at a place called Hart and Common. It happens around 2006, uh, in the middle of summer, um, a young couple were walking over Harton Common, and they used to go down there a lot, just going for walks, having drinks, but this night um, they hadn't been drinking, and there had been storms at the time, but this night it was fairly clear, it was quite a still, quite a warm night. As they're walking along, they look over towards the town of Ware, which is just a few miles away across the common, and they see a giant um, glowing orange ball. Now, it's pulsating a little bit. Was it the sun? It wasn't the sun. It was night time, I told you. <laughs> Listen, pay oh, attention. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it was, it was there and pulsating and apparently moving slowly from left to right. Um, it wasn't a helicopter either. There was no noise. Um, to be heard and again it was a still night you couldn't hear any sound of rotors or engines or anything and after moving left to right and just hovering there for a while it moved diagonally up and to the left and then dropped quite rapidly then moved to the right again and then up and diagonally more to the right then it sort of held this kind of pattern of moving about and changing speeds while doing it and then just zipped off into the horizon. And this whole process took about five to 10 minutes. It was there. Um, mm. Unfortunately, they had no camera phones because that wasn't as big a thing back then. But yeah, they both saw the same thing and no explanation for it. Um, and their names were Jess and Andy. Um, because it was me. <laughs> what? <laughs> Yep. <laughs> um, yeah, that that was uh, that was first-hand account. That is. Did you have missing time? 
Uh, not to my knowledge. It was, I mean, the whole thing was a blur. As I said, normally we'd be drinking, so. But, yeah, this night we hadn't had a drop to drink. And it was, I, I honestly have no explanation for it. Um, I, first of all, I thought, was it a helicopter? Hmm. But yeah, no, no sound of rotors. It was still you can you can hear them at that distance. You know, it looked like it was about two or three miles away from us. To, to um, yeah, just sort of off to the east of us. And yeah, no idea what it was. Um, the only thing I can ration, like, the only rational explanation I can come up with, because again, someone said a drone, but again, they weren't really a thing then. You know. Um, mm. The only rational explanation I can come up with for that is a ball lightning, an instance of ball lightning. There had been a lot of storms that week. There wasn't that night, but apparently mm. Hertfordshire is a hotspot for ball lightning, and that has weird colours and behaves in weird ways. Yeah. But other than that, now, no one saw anything. that I, I did look it up later on. No one saw anything that night, but around that time, there had been several sightings of strange lights in the sky. Um, around that sort of that summer yeah again i honestly that is i've i think i mentioned before i've i've seen what i think might have been ghosts but i was quite young and i've that honestly the ufo i i have no idea what that was it's um wasn't a plane wasn't a helicopter wasn't a drone um mm. and it moved really weird no no helicopter i've seen can move in that pattern it's sort of changed its direction as i said just zipping up and down then slowly moving then zipping down again and then it just kind of whipped off into the horizon quite quickly quicker than any helicopter i've seen move because we were talking about how before ufos people used to think of the lights as fairies and witches and stuff but i did find that there is a case from the 12th century where um, religious pilgrims in southwest England report seeing a glowing fire belching, and then they describe it as a dragon. Yep, I, I saw that one. It emerges from the sea, flies into the air, and then disappears. Time switch, aeroplane. <laughs> Aeroplanes don't emerge from the sea. Special aeroplane. <laughs> <laughs> but, but if you start to look into the phenomena... As, as is happening, a lot of sightings are craft that are disappearing under the water and coming out of the water. Yep, that's true. I think some of the, um, yeah, the US um, Air Force and Navy ones that have been released recently have yeah. described that. And we don't know of any craft that could do that. No. Without even slowing down. They're just straight into the water or straight up into the air. It's bizarre. I, I personally, I know we, we haven't gone into this yet, but, but I think you sort of covered whether you're a believer or not because you've got your own experience. I, I don't know that was, I don't know if that was aliens, you know, I don't know what that was, but yeah, but, like, go on. Yeah. I, was say, I do think something is happening. It's something. weird. I was chatting about this just yesterday, mostly because I was researching it. <laughs> um, but. While I still have a lot of sceptical leanings compared to a lot of things, I'm much more of a believer, I guess, um, you know, in in this. I'm I'm less less scully and more molder when it comes to this, you know. Yeah. Um yeah. I think you've got governments around the world that are releasing documentation and they're saying we've got these sightings, they're releasing video footage and going we don't know what this is. Yes, it's it's true. Um, the the American ones kind of threw me, you know, sort of chatting about, uh, joking about getting Tom DeLonge on the uh, the podcast, you know. But, um, you know, the, the stuff that came out around the time he was talking about it a lot. And it's like, oh, shit, they're actually releasing something. And I just thought it was going to be, yep, yeah, we don't know. Here's a few weird grainy pictures. But, but like, some of the footage that came out of like the crafts, like they were tailing and just yeah. how they moved and listening to the pilots speak to each other about it. Mm. And, you know, it's genuine stuff that the government's released and, you know, what's the conspiracy believing in that or believing that the government did it to distract from other things, you know, it's, but it's, yeah, I mean, 
part of me thinks I'm, I'm kind of in a conundrum. Do I do I think that it's uh, maybe I shouldn't be taking it so seriously, and it's you know sort of no because people don't seem that bothered. But part of me's thinking, what the hell is that? Is no one else like that curious? Like what? Could you should be bothered. Exactly. Whatever it is, I mean. Did you see the one that was recently mentioned about in Ukraine with no. Russia? So ever one of the um, nuclear, I think it's a silo, nuclear silos. Yeah. They um, they reckon that the, the nukes were armed with secret codes that only a few people know. And the, the missiles were set to launch, which they're listing as possibly would have caused World War Three because these nuclear weapons from Russia in Ukraine would have been launched. And they're saying it was when a craft was hovering over that they, they went into launch mode. And then the craft disappeared and everything went back to normal. That's horrendous. <laughs> yes. I'll, have to, I'll have to look that one up. I'll have to look that one up. Wow. Um, uh, what's the guy's name? Who's um, There's that famous American reporter that's got into, I think he's got a podcast now on UFOs. I can't think of his name, but he's one of the ones that have brought this story to light because he's approaching the American government and trying to get them to yeah. answer for what this shit is. I mean, there's a, the, U, the UK government website has a list of yes, UK it does. sighted. Um, Going back to, I think, 1997 that they've released. So, like, yeah, I don't know. It's, yeah, it's, it's I mean, even... Um... Buzz Aldrin, he's kind of backtracked on it a little bit now, but you know, when when they are on uh, Apollo 11, you know, um, they saw some weird stuff. You know, they, yeah. they radioed in asking like how far ago their booster was, like how where their booster should be. Yeah. And they said, oh, you know, it's, it's so many thousands of nautical miles away or hundreds of nautical miles away from you. I can't remember what the exact figure was. But then he he said there was something essentially because he didn't because it was all being broadcast live. He didn't want to worry anyone. He didn't want to make yeah. it seem like they were going nuts. But he then said that there was something keeping alongside the the the, the craft uh, mm. for like a couple of hours or something like that before leaving again. And mm. you know, it could have been space junk, but there weren't exactly much space junk up there at that point. You know, it'd be shouldn't have been no. No, it had been an incredibly, you know, sort of rare occurrence to see anything else human made in space at that point. Mm. Um, but yeah, he kind of backtracked on it a little bit now. But um, yeah, yeah, he was definitely, you know, he said that's why I asked, you know. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no, I definitely think there's something in it. I I really do believe there's something in it. Um, and, I wonder uh, if they're more. They're not manned a lot of them. I know we've I've just done some abduction cases, but I wonder if they're more like drones. I'd I'd, I'd see that, you know. So I mean, if nothing else, those breakneck speeds, you know, and like the description and the size. Or AI. A lot of them are quite small. Or AI. Yeah, that's it. Maybe they are probes if they are alien origin. And you've got like generals and come out and people that have worked high up at NASA and in the Air Force in America have come out and said. You know, there is something going on and whatever it is, you know, some of them have said you should, in a way, you should hope that it's alien. Because, like, if another if another country has technologically this vastly superior to what we've got, it's probably quite bad news, you know? We don't know <laughs> if it's aliens, then it's good news. <laughs> well, this is it. This is it. Um, yeah. But, you know, I... AI seems likely. Yeah, I mean, if we we can't get to another planet based on our current technology, but if we sent AI into space, it could potentially in a million years reach another planet that's inhabited, and they'll yeah. go, well, what are these weird things? Yeah, hundred percent. But then, to what end? You know, what drives someone or something to send something off that they will never see the results from? We've done it. We've sent stuff into space. This is true, but that was mainly to gather data. I, I mean, I guess at that point when we were sending this stuff into space, like with messages on and things like that, it was kind of thinking, well, we don't know. There might be, there might even be something within our solar system. You know, there were re 
I mean, to an extent, yeah. they still are kicking around the, the idea that there's been life on Mars. You know, they think there might be some life on one of Jupiter's moons. Yeah. Um, but probably nothing that could communicate with us. There's another claim that it's us from the future. I've heard that one. I have heard that one. Which is why we're kind of monitoring and taking samples. There's what I've, I've heard one version is that that's why they're taking samples and sexually assaulting people, if you like. Because yeah. in the future, people are becoming sort of impotent. And so they're coming to the past to get. Yeah, it's it's a theory, you know. If um, you oh, know, it's if a theory. Something's, gone wrong, <laughs> if something's gone wrong with us in the in the future, um, which is you know it opens up all sorts of questions, you know. So if we finally yeah. crack time travel, um, yeah. But it's funny. I I get a lot of stick, you know, sort of especially when people learn that I do the podcast sort of thing, and they're like, "How can you be such a skeptic?" Um, as you come across as you know and believe in aliens but I don't to me personally thinking that we are alone in the universe is kind of very arrogant you know <laughs> it's, yeah um it'd be weird if we were it would be really weird if we were and you know you've got the whole Fermi paradox thing where it's like you know if there are aliens why aren't they why haven't we met them why haven't we got any signal sign of them a well the, the main thing is the best way I've seen it described if someone walked up to the ocean, got a bucket, dunked it in, emptied it, there were no fish in there, therefore fish don't exist. <laughs> it's yeah. like space is really big and time is really long. You know, there's a good chance there's been so many civilizations that have been and gone before we were here or have yet to come. And the ones that are there yeah. at the same time as us so far away. But I don't know, going back to it, I, I definitely think there is there is something weird about all these, you know. I think a lot of them, like many things, are probably mistaken. They're probably hoaxes. But there are a few that you see and a few that you hear and you think, okay, that that seems like it happened and I really cannot think of an explanation for that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So six episodes in, we finally got something we believe in. <laughs> there you go, finally. <laughs> Woo! Um <laughs> And this is looking at the time. So this is getting into quite a long episode as well. Um, and we haven't even got to weird news yet. <laughs> and I, like, they're, they're, I, we're going to have to return to this. I mean, we've got related subjects as well that we've kind of touched on today. Crop circles, yeah. cattle mutil mutilations, abductions, men in black. Like you could. Yeah. You could just have a podcast on this subject and nothing yeah. else. I mean, um, you know, sort of, yeah, I'm sure there's some good ones on you know, G-men like arriving in black suits and blacked out cars at these sort of events. And, you know, as you say, there are so many, so many things that tie to this. So yeah, I definitely think yeah. it's something we've got to come back to. Yes. Um, and in particular, there are two cases that will need their own episodes because I'd need to do more investigating first and because they, they'd be quite long. But there's a Scottish village that is a UFO hotspot. It's like, Hundreds of sightings a year is one of the main places if you want to see a UFO that you go to. Nice. Um, and in Norway, there's uh, something called the Hesdalen Lights, which is often listed as Norway's answer to Roswell. Ah. Uh, I think we will return to this at a later date. I, I think it's got to happen. I think it's got to happen. Every now and then we are going to need to spice the podcast up with things that we actually believe in so you know it's... <laughs> <laughs> well yeah so let's let's get into some weird news have you okay. got something for me today um i do um right so uh let me see where i've pulled this up this is from the metro another one from the metro and a uh, biblical plague of frogs toads and tadpoles causes multi-car pileup for those that aren't watching, I'm doing a little jig because I nearly did that story. And I chose a different one. <laughs> when I in saw fact, this, I there like... were actually there were two though because there's that one and there's another related one about a plague oh, of locusts. Right. Yeah, it's I, I very nearly did this one, um, and then nearly didn't do it because you, I I, I knew you'd have seen it. 
but I thought, <laughs> you know, I'm going for it. Um, Go for it. So this was reported, um, yeah, a few weeks ago. And a biblical plague of toads, frogs, and tadpoles wreaked havoc in Honduras in a um, Honduras city, even causing a multi-car pileup. Um, the amphibians took over the streets and homes of uh, Chiloma after heavy rain fell in the area, causing drains to overflow and puddles to form. The outbreak started on uh, December the 3rd, according to locals, and continued for at least three days. At one point, a uh, pickup truck lost control in the slime left behind mm. and caused a pileup involving at least five vehicles, including a tanker, mm. two lorries, and a motorbike that was left burnt to a crisp. There were no wow. fatalities, thankfully, um, but the road was blocked for some time, causing a long tailback to residents. Some of the people caught up in the crash had to be taken to hospital in the nearby city of San Pedro Sula. Several people filmed the creatures swarming the area, including one man who said, this scares me, it looks more like the plagues of Egypt. Mm. Um, which, according to the Book of Exodus, the second plague of Egypt was a plague of frogs. An account says, it literally just goes into the biblical accounts, but yeah, looking at the pictures, um, there's, yeah, they're, they're everywhere. Um, earlier this month, another biblical plague, um, this time of locusts, hits uh, Yucatan in Mexico. Is that the one you were thinking of? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. My... And I find that weird because they're both, I mean, basically South America, there's two plagues. Yeah. It's weird. Miles on clouds of the bugs blanks in the skies, flying through shopping plazas, smacking into the windows of apartment complexes and gobbling up anything green in local parks. Cool. Locusts are a huge problem. They'll devour an entire field of crops. Like, yeah. Massive problems. Yeah, nasty, nasty things. Um, yeah, Taste that... all right though, don't they? Yeah, they do. They do. I've tried <laughs> one before. <laughs> When was that? Oh, I don't know. Some some other uh, podcasts. Once upon a time. Although I don't think, <laughs> as of recording this, I don't think that one's out yet. So no, but it'll possibly go out before this. I don't know actually. I mean, if anyone doesn't listen to Will I Like It, we're doing the worst foods suggested by people. Actually, it was crickets though, wasn't it? it wasn't locusts? Mm. You haven't eaten a locust. Yeah. Um, crickets less threatening younger brother. Uh, locusts less threatening younger brother. Yeah, actually, they weren't that bad. So I say, eat the plague. Eat the plague. <laughs> <laughs> people eat frogs. People eat, you know. Um, Put it on yeah. a t-shirt. Eat that. That's plague. it. Eat the locusts before they eat your crops. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, that's well. There, there is that theory, isn't there, that um, a lot of the biblical plagues were perhaps caused by certain um geographical phenomena at the time that caused one thing to happen after the other after the other and you know that that would check you know um yeah. especially considering the egyptian um climate was very different in uh biblical times so mm. um so what you got weird news wise well as you know, in the past, it's been mentioned that we go off topic from what we're supposed to be talking about in the episode. It has been. We we have been accused of this, yes. So I have two, that's right, two weird newses based around UFOs. Well done, well done. Bringing it back. <laughs> <laughs> so um, both posted on the same day. It was the 20th, so yesterday. Nice. Um, yeah, and I'll keep them both brief because there's two. I mean, the headlines are always the best bit, aren't they, really, with these? But um, so the first one's from The Sun is Alien Aircraft UK Missile Base Tracks UFO Leaving RAF Experts Baffled and Sparking a Top Secret Probe. Um, the object was tracked by a base that can give a four-minute warning of a nuclear strike. Britain's ballistic missile early warning base in Yorkshire tracked a UFO spark in a top secret probe has been revealed. Top brass at RAF Flingdales, Fling, Filingdales maybe, near Whitby, was baffled by the unknown target and ordered an investigation. Um, does say that the base part of the NORAD missile defense system was famous for its free golf ball shaped 
radomes during the Cold War that were used to track missiles fired from the Soviet Union. They would give a dreaded four-minute warning of any incoming attack. But UFOs often popped up on the radar screens, it can be revealed. And then, to tie in with that same story, West Yorkshire Police... Oh, this is the Metro, by the way. Yeah. Yeah, so this one's from the Metro. The headline is West Yorkshire Police Overwhelmed by UFO Reports as Woman Beamed into Sky. Andy raised his eyebrows then at that, for anyone that's not watching. <laughs> <laughs> Where was this one? West Yorkshire. Same area. Yeah, you've got... Uh, I'm impressed you've got not only two weird moves that are topical, but both based in the UK this time as well. Oh, yes. I think you've won so... weird news. <laughs> And and the episode before this was with Jimmy, who lives in Yorkshire, so it's all tying together nicely. With Not Wessex, but... though, is it? <laughs> <laughs> um, West Yorkshire police are dealing with a shocking number of UFO sightings every day. Too many for them to share, according to the force. Mm -hmm. A Freedom of Information request submitted to the force revealed that since 2020, it's logged 1,805 cases in which the word UFO, alien, UAP, or spaceship appear in the record. Um the figure averages 56 a month or almost two every day. Um, there was another bit I was going to mention. Yeah, so the most recent Freedom of Information submitted by the UFO Truth magazine editor Gary Hesseltine from Featherstone in West Yorkshire was refused on the basis that it would cost too much to sift through and retrieve the information. In its official response, the force said, unfortunately, West Yorkshire police are unable to provide the information you've requested. It's estimated the cost of providing and locating the information you seek within your request would exceed the time threshold. When a reasonable estimate has been made that the appropriate limit would be exceeded, there are no requirements for a public authority to undertake the work. The legal cost for an FOI is currently set to £450, and West Yorkshire Police estimate that at approximately two minutes per record, the research required would be more than 60 hours, costing far more than that limit. However, the force did share one record from its database. While a time or location was not specified, the report read, mail caller reports seeing four flashing lights hovering above his property in the street before a female was beamed into the sky. Wow. Yeah. That's, um, that is weird. That's my weird news. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I wonder if they shared that one because it sounds more outlandish and they thought if we share this, no one will be bothered because they won't take it seriously. Maybe, maybe. Or maybe that was the most tame one. But then that's, yeah, that's an official response from the police. So at least someone did report that case. Yeah. Whether it happened or not. Was it you? Were you mm. making some weird news? <laughs> <laughs> just gonna start. I need some weird news. I'm going to create some. If that had happened in Wiltshire, maybe, but come on. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, yeah. I guess that, that's about it from us today. It is, although, Andy, there is one last thing before we go. Very Do important. What? Whilst I was doing my research, I came across a case that we nearly would have had today. Um. So I found a case in Sussex where there's a woodland where not only have UFOs been seen, but ghosts have been seen. On several occasions, people have gone missing and bodies have been found. Pets have disappeared. And there's a rumour that a satanic cult uses the site for its rituals. Oof. Sounds and it's in Sussex. Two hours from here. So I suggest, I'm putting it to you now, I suggest that we make a visit to the site and the next episode we talk about all the cases that have happened in that wood, from that wood. Why would I and want to go there? <laughs> maybe stay till after dark and see whether we see anything, experience anything, see any satanic cults. I'm, I'm, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Fuck it. <laughs> there you go. Right. So next episode, we're going to be recording together for a change. 
Yeah. It, um... From a woodland <laughs> somewhere in Sussex. <laughs> Nor- normally, we only do that from when I like it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm on that. And you know I'll what? bring some weird food just so you feel at home. <laughs> you know what? We see aliens, Satanists, you know, whatever. It'll, it'll be jelly deals. <laughs> <laughs> all right so we'll leave it there but yeah hopefully the next episode then is going to be us in the woods in sussex nice doing some live reporting yeah hopefully not our last episode uh but then at least they'll say we died doing what we loved that's it that's it probably have more viewers than we've ever had on that one you know yeah yeah awesome Uh, right Well, that's about it, I think. So until next time. Stay weird.